Only 12% of Americans are metabolically healthy. You just touched upon a problem, a worldwide problem, which actually sparked my interest. This was out of pure curiosity. I just wanted to understand completely what is actually happening. Dr. Susanna Soberg. She's a scientist, an author, a researcher, and an innovator, a leading expert in the application of cold and heat therapy. Her work being featured on prominent platforms like the Huberman Lab podcast, the Joe Rogan Experience, and BBC Radio. Let me make it a little bit simple for the listeners because there is a lot of terminology right here. Women have more brown fat than men. How can we get rid of uh, sugar cravings? We have access to food all the time. We are never hungry. People are scared of getting hungry almost. If you look at both type 2 diabetes, obesity, neurological diseases, or depression, and anxiety, the root cause of all these modern uh, chronic diseases are actually inflammation and stress. We have to do something about that. Cold water is just more stressful for the body compared to sitting in a sauna. So you will have a loss of temperature in your core that is much faster as soon as you drop your head. We need to understand what actually is keeping people on the healthy side. And when we know more about that, then we can also tell people to keep doing this or start doing that. The Avenue of the Strongest is a podcast dedicated to exploring the lives and experiences of the most inspiring individuals from around the world. Each episode features interviews with fascinating guests who share their insights and wisdom on a variety of topics, including education, impact, motivation, health, and learning. Here are your hosts, Aniette Chowdhury and Vlad Suleiman. This podcast is sponsored by Argo Prep, an award-winning edtech company serving over a million students nationwide. We understand that as parents, you want to ensure that your child receives the best education possible. Say hello to Argo Prep. With over 15 plus educational awards earned in just the past year, Argo Prep's platform offers your child video lessons, quizzes, drills, printable worksheets, and more. Best of all, your Argo Prep subscription comes included with four comprehensive digital workbooks that cover all four subjects math, ELA, science, and social studies. Visit argoprep.com today and start your free trial. Welcome. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much. Thank you for that introduction as well. I'll see if I can live up to that. <laughs> so beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> I, you, you already have, and we are very excited to get to get to talk with you. Before I kind of dive into your past and background and your research experience, I'd love to learn, uh, because we just, the last guest we got off with, uh, we just learned about scary headlines and statistics that and I'm not a, I'm not sure if this is currently accurate or if the statistics is even worse, but roughly about 12% of Americans, yes, Americans, are metabolically uh, unhealthy. I'm so, sorry, 12% are only metabolically healthy. Yeah. My question is first: What does it What does it mean when you're when someone is metabolic me, metabolic metabolically healthy? What does that mean? When a person is metabolic healthy, they have a glucose. Um, you can say a glucose balance in the body, meaning that it's not going over a certain threshold or under it. And when the insulin sen sensitivity is normal, that means that you can, you can eat uh, something and then within a certain amount of time, within a few hours, you will, the body will clear the sugar or the, the glucose from the bloodstream uh, in the right uh, you can say time, so you don't get a high spike of glucose uh, at a certain point. So the glucose level should not get too high or too low. If it gets too high, you will have um, it, you will probably be in in a, a, a certain group where you have um, a insulin resistance. So if you uh, are mm -hmm. metabolic healthy, your body will be able to get rid of sugar uh, and also fat. Um, within a, a short time after you have eaten it. Um, and this can be measured by your doctor. So if you are uncertain, if you are metabolic healthy, you can go and, to your doctor and you can get your glucose levels, plasma levels measured to see if these are normal uh, um, within, uh, within a normal range. And you will probably have to test this a, a couple of times. So if it gets too high, then you are 
you are in the risk of getting pre-diabetes or even get it being diabetic. Right. So you can do a lot to um, um, avoid getting a, a insulin resistant, or you can also uh, increase your insulin sensitivity so your sugar will be taken up in your cells much faster. And you have, of course, what I will call the microdosing something kind of stress, which you just presented just before. But you can do that with exercise. You can do it with cold exposure. You can do it with heat exposure. So all these kind of like healthy kind of stressors will help your body to increase the insulin sensitivity in the body. Wow. I mean, this is this looks like it's a serious problem. And by the way, I'm definitely in that group of metabolic metabolically unhealthy i haven't even gone the gotten the test but that's what i'm going to do actually the next time i go to the doctor but how do we get how did we get to these grim stats over here roughly 88 percent of americans are not considered metabolically healthy i mean that is a concern but even more so it's a concern especially in our community we come from the south asian culture so bengalis Indians, Pakistani, that whole region, I mean, <laughs> it is practically unheard of when you're 50 years old or 55 years old that you do not have diabetes, that everybody over there almost has diabetes, hypertension. It's, 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 it's a very big concern, but we'll, we'll, let's, we'll go ahead and talk a little bit more about that later on. But I'd love to learn more about you as a person. I mean, what inspired you to, like, how do you end up doing a PhD in metabolism? What, what inspired that? Oh, yeah, that's a good question. I think you just touched upon a problem, a worldwide problem, which actually sparked my interest uh, for uh, doing research in metabolism. Okay. So this problem that you just described is something that we have to do something about. We are doing a lot and, and the problem has like increased from the 1980s where we can really see the statistics showing that obesity and type 2 diabetes and chronic uh, diseases, uh, inflammatory diseases are going up and it's still going up uh, those curves. So we can see that we have still a problem that which we need to do something new about. So we have a lot of um, companies doing um, new kind of uh, drugs, which is good because people need help to get started with their diets and get started uh, losing weight. But we also have a lot of people who are mm. not there yet and they are still healthy. So we need to also understand how can we keep those people healthy so they don't end up in the big pile of people um, being metabolic unhealthy. So we need to do, we need to learn, mm. we need to understand what actually is keeping people on the healthy side. And when we know more about that, then we can also tell people to keep doing this or start doing that because then we will have more people not being too um, inflammatory and, and stressed, which is causing these metabolic um, diseases. So that's actually the interest that is that got me back to university and um, studied um, yeah. um, uh, preventive medicine. Uh, and first thing I wanted to do is to see how can we get rid of uh, sugar cravings. So sugar cravings is because people mm. snack all the time. And that's kind of one of the problems that we that we have. We have um, uh, access to food all the time. We are never hungry. People are scared of getting hungry almost today. So they think that when the stomach is saying, I'm hungry, then they need to eat immediately after um, or even actually before right. just to prevent not having that feeling of hunger. Uh, it's a scary feeling. Uh, so people have learned that being hungry is not something that you should, do, should be. So um, today we are mm. constantly taking on bringing food and having snacks everywhere. So if we could get rid of the craving or maybe just dampen the craving a bit, that would be also a way to, to, to help people not um, overeating. So that's why I started going when I went back to the university and studied uh, the sweet tooth. And we also published a paper about that. But after that, I thinking, okay, could we do some kind of like activity? Um, could we, uh, prevent um, or increase um, insulin sensitivity and lower inflammation and stress in the body. Because I have found out that that is actually the root cause of all these modern lifestyle diseases. If you look at both type 2 diabetes, obesity, if you look at uh, neurological diseases, like depression and anxiety, the root cause of all these modern uh, 
uh, chronic diseases are actually inflammation and stress. So we have to do something about that. So what we then eventually found out was that brown fat, which is our healthy kind of fat in the body, if we activate that, it will actually get rid of some of your white fat in the body. So that is the unhealthy fat and also glucose, so uh, sugar mm -hmm. in the bloodstream. And that way we can get healthier. But how to activate that? That was kind of like the, the whole thing why I started my PhD to find out how can we activate the brown fat, our metabolism in a natural way without drugs, but in with an activity um, and cold seems to be the most potent activator and stressor for um, the body and activating the brown fat. So that's why I started my research. Wow. This this is certainly a global problem. So thank you for dedicating, of course, your life work now into this research. I want to set the foundation for anybody who is listening here because you've thrown around some terms, uh, which is brown fat and white fat. And these are fundamental to your research. So I want to establish the foundation for anyone who's, who is listening, who, who, who may be saying, what, what's, what's brown fat? What's white fat? And correct me if I'm wrong, white fat are... This is the fat from the, the the food that we eat, right? This is the quote unquote unhealthy fat, if you have, right? That is the unhealthy fat. And then the brown fat that we have is packed. These are packed with mitochondria and they're called brown because of the high uh, iron that's found in there. But this brown fat plays a role in thermogenesis. Is that correct? I mean, I, I'm not an expert. So let's, can we, can we get the foundational work between white fat and yeah, brown fat? I can, I can, I think I can say it pretty like quick and also to just to make the, the, the headlines for that. So the white fat is the unhealthy kind of fat that we have around our inner organs and we have on our stomach and our thighs and we want to get rid of that, right? And it is storing our energy in the body. Opposite to that, we have the brown fat, which is increasing our energy uh, expenditure in the body, so increasing metabolism. So the brown fat is our healthy fat filled with mitochondria. It can uh, get rid of the unhealthy fat. So one fat is storing fat, and the mm -hmm. other fat type, the brown fat, is actually um, getting rid of fat. So they are working opposite. You can actually compare the brown fat in the body with... Um, it, it looks a little bit like or works a little bit like uh, our muscle tissue. Our muscles are also filled with mitochondria. We can activate the muscle tissue and that will also increase heat in the body, which the brown fat also does as an outcome. Mm -hmm. And it can also uh, use glucose and fat as fuel, the, the muscles and, and the brown fat does as, as well. But what the brown fat specifically do is actually increasing your heat in the body as well. And it does that way before the muscles will increase heat. So you can think about it this way. So mm, the brown okay. fat has two purposes. One is to increase your metabolism so, um, so you will uh, burn some calories. But the main thing is actually, the first thing is that it increases your heat in the body to keep you warm. So as soon as you get just a little bit cold on your skin, sensors or cold receptors in the skin will send a signal to the brain in what is called the hypothalamus, where the temperature regulating center is. And in the brain there, it will send um, or release noradrenaline, uh, which is a neurotransmitter and also a hormone, which will activate the brown fat in the body. And we have that located six different places in the body. So it's, it's very strategically uh, placed around our central nervous system. So nature is really, you can say very clever in that way because um, it's closely centered to our brain and the brain is going to signal to the brown fat to get activated because oh, now you're getting a little bit cold on your skin and we need to regulate your temperature in the body so we don't freeze to death or <laughs> just get hypothermic. So the brain and the body is working together in that way to keep that stable or stabilizing that temperature in the body. So you will always be around 37 degrees Celsius uh, to to have that um, normal temperature to to take care of your vital organs in the body hey there before we dive back into the episode i wanted to stop for just a brief moment and express our heartfelt gratitude knowing that you've chosen to spend your time with us to listen and engage with our content truly warms our hearts 
Every story we share, every topic we discuss is made much more meaningful if you are here with us on this journey. If you found value in what you've heard so far and you're excited as we are about the episodes to come, we'd be so honored if you'd hit that subscribe button. It not only ensures you stay informed of all of our new content, but it also supports us in continuing to create and share. From all of us here, a sincere thank you. Now, without further ado, let's get back to the episode. Wow, that, thank you so much for that breakdown. That's very clear. Uh, I'll, I'll pass it over to Vlad. So now we can get into the, you know, how do we hack this? How do we activate the brown <laughs> fat and, and, and go on from there? Yeah, since we're speaking about your personal experience, I want to um, actually ask you to share your personal experience, how it affected uh, the mental and physical health in you. Uh, with me, I think that, yeah. So I started this cold water immersion experience or journey for myself because I was doing the research. So this was out of pure curiosity. I just wanted to to understand completely what is actually happening. And before I became a winter swimmer, um, I was reading all the literature first because I, I was not a winter swimmer be myself before I, I started this research. I just want to mention that because some people might think that I started out being very um, extreme in, in doing cold exposure or heat exposure, but I, I really wasn't. I was just like anybody else, afraid of the cold and also avoiding the heat a bit um, and not really wanting to do anything else which, that wasn't thermoneutral, you can say. And that's how our society is today. We try to keep ourselves as thermoneutral as we can because we think this is how it should be, right? But today uh, we are starting to realize that uh, that going into cold and going into the heat is actually activating our cells in the body in a healthy way, which will then increase our, um, our health, both physically and mentally. But what I didn't understand from reading all the literature before I became a winter swimmer myself was the connection. I didn't really feel what I was reading. And that is really where I started understanding that if you read something and you study something, you start to understand this when you practice this. So I think that some questions are easily uh, answered once you understand the practice. And when you do the practice, you also ask the right questions. So when I did start my winter swimming journey myself, I started to realize what actually, how this really feels and how this really connects with the body and how the brain and the body really connects with how, how dopamine and noradrenaline increases and how does that feel in the body. But for me, it was, it was, it was almost like a project in itself to feel how, um, or understand how, how the research, um, feels in the, in the body, you can say. So I understood it, but I didn't really feel it until I started myself. Thank you for giving me hope because I, I've never done, uh, I've never experienced cold immersion and I'm going to try it, but I thought, I thought you already practiced this from before your research. So, so, so learning that about yeah, you are not only didn't practice it, you also don't like heat and sauna. No, I don't, but this is why we're, t this is why we're having this conversation. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but you you're speaking about uh the swimming but what about the ass bath is it the same thing if i want to practice it or i have to immerse myself in an ocean for example yeah so when i talk about winter swimming i really mean just cold exposure or ice bath cold plunging um all together so winter swimming is more like a term that I use because in Denmark we call it winter swimming, but many don't really swim. They just sit in the water or move a little bit in the water. So you right. can easily do that also in an ice bath. So if you don't have access to open water, don't worry. You can just get a, buy a, a bin or a big bin that you usually have in your garden and just jump into that or yeah. some kind of like, yeah, barrel or there are a lot of like, um, cold plunge uh, uh, companies today who also sell these kind of things. So you can find some uh, for your budget, but you can also find something really cheap in, in a supermarket. So it's really where you have your, or how you can get across for this. That Some people also just have a, a bathtub in, in their house and they can also use that. 
cold showers is also a thing. So if you don't have access to any of this and you just want to try it out and just get a little bit familiar with the cold, then start out with cold showers. Um, it's not going to do exactly the same. It's not the same benefits completely, but it will give, it will make you more familiar with the cold. And I think that is where you start if you really think that the cold water mm. is scary to you. So cold showers just for a few seconds, just get familiar with it so it's not that scary anymore. Cold shower. Uh, if somebody is listening to us from Florida, this is not for you because there is no cold shower in Florida. <laughs> really? I was, you know, oh, I was pipes. practicing cold shower already like 10 years and I was living two years in Florida. Oh my God. Their cold shower oh is God. a hot shower. <laughs> <laughs> um, also, I, what caught my attention in that, uh, in some of your posts, you mentioned that women have more brown fat than men. So could you please share why is this the case and how does it affect their response uh, to cold? Yeah, so women apparently have more uh, brown fat than men. And um, the reason for that could be because men have more muscle mass. And when you have more muscle mass, you will also be better at creating heat in the body. So we have two tissues in the body that can create heat. So we have the brown fat and we have um, the muscles. And if you have less muscle mass, uh, you, you would need to like compensate uh, for that muscle mass in other ways. So women have apparently more brown fat and that could be one of the reasons. Women also have smaller hearts compared to men. So men have, um, a, if they have bigger hearts that also have a better ability to pump the, the blood around in the body, which will also mm. keep uh, all the organs uh, warmer mm. and the muscles are bigger and, or, or they are, are more of it, of it. So they can also increase the heat better and they can also pump uh, the blood around in, in more efficiently compared to women. Women on the other hand, have then a little bit more brown fat. Or I think that is the reason why women have more brown fat because they need something else to compensate for that heat loss that they have because they are also smaller in in their um, in their volume, so they lose more heat, and that means that we have to compensate in some way. So more brown fat, but we also have more white fat, and that's also going to uh, compensate for that heat loss because we have then a more um, more insulation to to keep our our heat uh, inside the body so that is probably why there is a re there is a, a, a difference in, in men and women and how we also um, increase uh, our or you, you can say increase our heat in the body by increasing our metabolism so more brown fat to women just means that uh, they can also increase their metabolism as soon as they get cold. And there is actually this interesting study which uh, where they compared uh, between gender uh, energy expenditure upon cold exposure. And in that study, they found that men and women increased their energy expenditure to the same degree. Uh, so in this study, uh, mm. they increased it by 6.5% in both uh, groups, so both men versus women. But how they did that um, so metabolically was very different. Um, women used more glucose, uh, had, had a, um, uh, you can say they, they used more glucose in the body, uh, they used more fat, they used more, um, they had a, an increase in leptin, they also have an increase in uh, adiponectin. So it seems that if you look at these hormones, um, that then you do see a difference uh, between gender. So women have another way of increasing their metabolism once they're cold, but the outcome is apparently the same. Mm, wow. Even, even though they have more brown fat than men. Yes. <laughs> interesting. Yeah, that's, that is very interesting. Dr. Soberg, I want to take you quick. quick I want to focus a little, one more question about, uh, uh, before plunging into the co into the ice cold water, uh, are there any precautions or safety measures one needs to take? So, for example, let's say for I've never done this. I'm, I'm going to go ahead because I live in New York City. I unfortunately have to get those buckets and fill it with ice and water. Um, and for anyone else who's going to potentially try it right now, are there any basic safety tips or something like 
uh, that that we that one should be aware of somebody with no prior experience yeah i definitely think so i always say that if people have um heart diseases or uh, unregulated high blood pressure uh, maybe cold exposure or heat exposure is maybe not for them so this is because mm. when you submerge yourself into cold water there will be an conflict in the nervous system because you activate both the sympathetic nervous system so that is your fight and fight part of your nervous system but also your parasympathetic nervous system which is your rest and digest part of your nervous system so that is the stress and uh, and rest system which is a bit in a conflict as soon as you submerge into cold water and that will put a bit of a strain on on the heart so if you have heart problems or unregulated high blood pressure, it could be um, too much uh, um, stress for uh, your cardiovascular system. So um, what happens is that initially when you have the cold shock, then you will have um, an, an activation of the sympathetic nervous system, which then will uh, also create um, arrhythmias to the heart. So that is why heart diseases okay. is something that I would um, say that if you have that, then avoid it. Or if you are just at least in in doubt about this, then see your your doctor and get your blood pressure measured, um, and hear if if this is something that you should do. Got it. No, thank you for that. And actually, <laughs> I do have to consult. And now I'm admitting to a problem, but I not that I have hypertension, but every time I go to the doctor, my blood my my systolic pressure does measure higher than normal. <laughs> It may be due to extreme nervousness uh -huh. for for uh, because of my worries with doctors, but that is that <laughs> that is always. Aside from that, everything else checks out with flying colors, except for uh, my systolic number on the blood pressure reading. So I suppose I'll consult a physician. And no, Vlad, this is not me trying to finesse my way out of trying <laughs> ice cold <laughs> yeah, bats. Yeah. <laughs> but but also, uh, I mean, you are in New York and. Um, when I was reading the book, you mentioned that in Coney Island, actually, I, I, well, I was living in Coney Island one year. This is the one of the oldest schools of the cold swimmers, right? Yes, I think so. Yeah, true. So, I mean, if you want to, if you want to immerse yourself, you Coney have, Island, go right back. Beautiful yeah. opportunity <laughs> over there. That, no, that sounds It's right awesome. next, actually. I was amazed. There was a picture in the book of, 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 of uh, this place. And I was driving every day. I never realized. Oh, about really? It. Oh, wow. Yeah. So fine. Right, maybe you, we'll check it out together. Um, you you yeah. need to send him the book. Yeah. Now you need to send him the book. So now he, he can he can start. You have to see your doctor first, but after that. <laughs> <laughs> no, definitely. I, this, this has been something top of, uh, like, one of my top things that I've been prioritizing to do or dig into and research and actually, actually start doing it. But... Um, now I really have to, especially after speaking with you. Oh, good, good. <laughs> uh, Suzanne, let's speak about the uh, article that you've uh, been part of, which is called Altered Brown Fat Thermoregulation and Enhanced Cold-Induced Thermogenesis in Young Healthy Winter Swimmers Men, where you're saying that the winter swimmers showed no glucose tracer uptake in the bed during a thermal comfort state. So does this suggest that frequent exposure to cold condition might alter the metabolic activity of bed in humans? Actually, let me let me make it a little bit simple for the listeners because there is a lot of terminology right here. So when the winter swimmers weren't cold, researchers didn't see any sugar being used up in their brown fat. Does this mean that being cold mm. often could change how brown fat works in people? Yes, and it's a really good question. We are not really sure uh, why uh, winter swimmers or people who are adapted to the cold don't take up uh, glucose during thermal neutrality or thermal comfortable states. Uh, but we, and the reason why I say we are not sure is because this will need another research, uh, scientific research mm. uh, study to really dig into like an also have the cells and look into the cells to say what is actually happening here. But what we think happens is that when you expose yourself to the cold and you do that repeatedly, you will increase the amount of mitochondria in the cells, which will make them more efficient. So if you have more efficient 
uh, brown fat cells, they don't need to activate as much or as long uh, during the thermal comfortable state and then take up uh, the sugar mm. from the bloodstream because it, they are already um, very adjusted. So you can say they are very efficient at increasing your temper or adjusting the temperature in the in the body. What we did also in that study was to look at the temperature in the winter swimmers during uh, um, room temperature during uh, two nights uh, or two days and two nights. And we did see that they had a continuously higher uh, temperature uh, increase uh, from the brown fat while they were just at room temperature. So it really shows that they have a both more heat loss because they are adapted to the, to the cold, then you lose more heat from the body because you are more best, you have higher vascularity in the skin. That means that the brown fat is also more activated to keep that temperature up in the body so you won't get too cold, right? So winter swimmers, mm. although you didn't see the glucose uptake during those days, we do see uh, that at room temperature, they have more activation of the brown fat and a more increase uh, of, uh, of, of heat. So uh, so winter swimmers mm. are warmer compared to, to people who are uh, not winter swimmers, which uh, boils down to they are losing more heat from the body. So they also had to create more heat to, to make that add up. I hope it makes sense. Mm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Could you please share also the uh, perfect daily like routine of alternating between ath bath and sauna? For example, I go to uh, ath bath. I'm trying right now to go to every day and I have sauna. So how long should I be in the ice bath and then how long I should be in a sauna and alternate? How many? So times? what we found in the study was that um, 11 minutes per week in the cold water uh, divided on two to three days and alternating with a sauna, uh, 57 minutes per week, and also two uh, sessions per day. Meaning that you could go to, uh, you can, on the same day, you could do cold water and sauna, but only have to do this maybe a couple of minutes at a time. So you can do a cold a plunge for one to two minutes or three minutes, and then you can go into the sauna for 10 to 15 minutes. And you don't have to stay long in the cold or in the heat in order for mm -hmm. you to get these benefits uh, that we found in this study. What, what about Dr. Sober? If I, if I stay longer right now, I'm staying in the cold water 12 minutes and doing sauna, maybe 20, 25 minutes every day. Is it increases substantially my benefits or is the same if I would do uh, your way? Or is it, or is it actually causing you or harm? Or is it making a <laughs> harm? Yeah. 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 I think that there is a, uh, there is a upper threshold. Um, and I think we have seen studies showing that the upper threshold for uh, heat, at least, uh, and using specifically uh, the sauna, um, uh, shown in the Finnish uh, sauna uh, observational studies, um, where we see that the higher threshold might be around uh, between 19 to 30 minutes. So if you exceed that, you, um, you we will see that you will have a, a, a higher risk again of a cardiovascular diseases. So this is what they measured on the outcomes were cardiovascular mm -hmm. diseases. Um, but if you stay under 19 uh, up to 30 minutes where it really plateaus out the benefits, then you will still have the benefits of this, what is called hormetic stress. And this is the healthy kind of stress that happens in the cell where we increase what is called heat shock proteins that repair the cells. But if you exceed that, then you will exhaust the cells. And that I also think we can apply to um, cold stress um, where you will just have to think about the for a much shorter amount of time because cold water is just more stressful for the body compared to sitting in a sauna, um, which is hot air. So it's not the same uh, kind of modality, you can say. So in the cold water, you should only stay for a few minutes and 12 minutes might be a little long, uh, but I cannot say from a research study that if you do that, then in, in 20 yeah. years, then you will have these problems. That study yeah. is not done yet, but I hope someone will do it. Mm -hmm. Dr. Sober, so I, I, I should pause myself a little bit. And before, before I pass it to Annette, I have one more question. I think it's important. What about 
uh, diving, do, should I should I put my um, head also to the cold water or up to the shoulders? How, how what was the ideal? Yeah, well, I think that people should judge for themselves. But what happens when you submerge into cold water is that you will, of course, you will lose heat. So the heat loss rate will uh, be high. But if you also dunk the head into the water, you will increase your heat loss uh, rate with uh, with um, extra thirty six percent. So that means that the heat loss from the head wow. is very high, and that's because there is no tissue between you can say the head and the big um, arteries in your neck and also into your core. So you will have a loss of temperature in your core that is much faster as soon as you dog your head. So in relation to safety and, and, and also hypother hypothermia, I would say that uh, you should stay on the safe side and you don't have to dunk the head in order for you to get the benefits. But if, if, you are, if you feel safe with that, then you can do that. But also always say, don't co-plunge or swim without um, anybody else. So I always say, go in pairs of two at least, because that is also a safety thing. We should remember that the cold is still an enemy for us and the cold water especially we can actually pass out and we can also drown so this is a healthy journey you can take if you take your precautions dr sober could you please uh, I, i'd love to give our listeners a brief understanding into your book winter swimming the nordic way towards healthier and happier life which is a must read book by the way and thank you very much for your kindness for sending over to vlad vlad has read it and has raved about it i am for sure to read it next uh what can reader uh, i was going to ask you actually well actually instead of okay i'll what can readers expect because i know we're very short on time so this will we'll wrap it up here but what can readers expect to to, to, to read in your book um so in my book i go through uh what is what happens in your physiology when you expose yourself to cold water uh, swimming or dipping, uh, cold plunging, and what happens when you use cold, cold, cold showers, but also what happens when you use a sauna. Um, so I go through the contrast therapy, you can say, but also the safety and the, all the benefits, both physically, but also mentally. So it's easy to read the book. It's in an easy language. So I have kind of like digested the, the science, the complex science and, and made it uh, I think very easy to uh, to read. So it's a good beginner's book if you are curious about what happens uh, in the body and in the brain when you go into the cold and you go into the heat. So, yeah. Awesome. I want to ask you one last question before I let you go. And I think this is a fantastic question because this speaks to a lot about uh, the potential future for uh, many, uh, uh, many of the diseases that we see. But has your research on brown fat thermoregulation and cold-induced thermogenesis given you any insights into, let's say, metabolic disorders like seen in patients with schizophrenia? And if so, could this winter swimming or these forms of regular cold exposure potentially have therapeutic benefits for these patients? I think there is a potential for that. Um, and that's because of the increase in neurotransmitters when you submerge into cold water. And also when you use uh, the heat, either if it's in a sauna or you use it as, uh, as in, in, a cold, in a hot tub. So uh, hot water has many benefits as well, also on anxiety and depression. So it could be that uh, these kind of, um, of extreme temperatures are actually helping our brain to reset uh, and and because it increases dopamine noradrenaline mm -hmm. endorphins and uh, also serotonin which is activated when we submerge into water as well and when we activate our vagus nerve so it's it's i think it there is a potential there and we do see more research coming um but for schizophrenia i i really don't know uh, but i think that it will be interesting mm. to have that study in the future mm. 
Dr. Soberg, it's been an absolute pleasure. Can you please let our audience know where can they find you? It's whether it's a website, whether it's a social platform to learn more about you or anything of that nature. Please let us yeah. know. Yeah. So I am easy to find. I hope <laughs> I am on, <laughs> I'm on Instagram. Uh, um, my name is uh, Susanna uh, Soberg. Um, and you can find me on soberginstitute.com where I also teach um, how to use cold and heat. Uh, in a safe and beneficial way, and also how to use your breath as a key, you can say, to stress up, to stress down. This sort of became a, a motto of mine because that's my my approach, the thermalist approach. So how to use your breath work uh, to uh, stre- help you stress down from when you have stressed up using uh, the cold and the heat. I have also a newsletter which you can uh, subscribe to, um, and uh, yeah, you can find that on my on my website on SoberInstitute.com. Dr. Soberg, thank you so much for this wonderful conversation. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you for having me. It was fun.